right, so we can go ahead and start. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah, and thank you for everyone else who tuned in today. Uh, today, we will be having a really important conversation on free speech and Islamic dissent. First, I'd like to start off by introducing myself. I, I'm going to be your host today, and my name is Hannah Noor. I am a senior at the University of Central Florida, double majoring in biomedical sciences and sociology. I'm also a critical thinking fellow in the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation. As a fellow, I'm able to start a conversation on my college campus to advance freedom and human rights, both in the United States and around the world. At, through the fellowship, we aim to strengthen liberties for students by nurturing critical thinking on US campuses. This fellowship is part of the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation, which is a nonprofit that works to protect women from honor violence, forced marriage, and genital mutilation, with an overall emphasis on liberty for all. The AHA Foundation also works to ensure that free speech is upheld in the face of opposition, censorship, and intimidation. This now brings us to today's topic. The dominant culture's silencing of dissenting voices within Islam prevents social progress. The lived experiences of ex-Muslims are stifled, and this needs to be addressed. In this event, we will explore the nuances of open dialogue within Islamic descent. This now brings us to our lovely speaker today, Sarah Hader. Sarah was born in Pakistan and raised in Texas, where she was a practicing Shia Muslim in her youth, before eventually apostatizing. Today, Sarah is a writer, speaker, and human rights activist, and is the co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America. This nonprofit advocates for acceptance of religious dissent, promotes secular values, and aims to reduce discrimination faced by those who leave Islam. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah Hader. Hi, I'm so glad to be here, Hana. Um, I'm excited for this conversation. I love the work of the AHA Foundation. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait, to, can't wait to get started. Awesome. Yeah, so the remaining of the webinar, for the remaining format of the webinar, I will be asking Sarah a series of questions. And if we have time towards the end, we will have an audience Q&A. So if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat right now. All right, so now we will start off with our first question. So Sarah, first of all, I'd really love to thank you for the risk you take both in your advocacy and for joining us today for this critical conversation. Ex-Muslims like me are appreciative of the strides, strides you and ex-Muslims of North America have taken to normalize Islamic dissent. Now you describe yourself as an ex-Muslim. Can you give us a little background on how you became an apostate and why you use this label? Yeah, so I mean, it was a, for, for many people, it's a very um, long journey. Um, for me, it was definitely a difficult journey, but something that happened rather quickly at a very, you know, momentous time of my life. I was a young, uh, uh, you know, critical thinking, newly critical thinking teen. Um, I had started questioning the world around me. I had started uh, to rebel against uh, my parents and like the the sort of background that I and culture that I grew up with, as do you know many teenagers. Um, uh, but with me, it also came with questioning the faith, um, questioning the uh, objective truth of the Quran. That is to say, is it is it a historical document that is, um, you know, something that we can trust as a source of, of truth? Um, I started questioning the um, ethics of Islam in particular, but also um, all revealed religions, um, even all Abrahamic religions. Um, I started questioning God. Um, I started, uh, you know, questioning uh, the existence of God uh, and, and started thinking about about these questions very, uh, very seriously for a, a, a critical period in my life. And I found that they didn't really uh, stand up to scrutiny, a lot of these concepts that I grew up with. And um, I, I, I mean, I've said it this way a million times because it's true. Um, I became an atheist before I became an ex-Muslim, right? So that's like, I, I, I left God 
And then I realized, oh, this means that I also don't uh, believe in Islam. Um, and I was somewhat, yeah, I, I think I'm lucky when it comes to ex-Muslims in that I had um, a relatively liberal upbringing and I use the term liberal and I, uh, you know, in a relative sense, I always emphasize that it's relatively liberal, which is to say that in a Western context, it was this extremely conservative religious upbringing, but in a Muslim context, you know, in a Pakistani context, um, my parents were fairly tolerant. Um, so that is to say, I grew up with a lot of, you know, uh, dress restrictions. I grew up with, you know, food restrictions. All of that is, you know, somewhat superficial. Um, but I also had limitations in how I could interact with the opposite sex. Obviously, no dating. There was an expectation of arranged marriage. Um, so it, there were there were, you know, quite a bit of uh, how I lived my life up until. To that point that was impacted by the the faith of my parents and how how I was expected to live from then on so leaving religion and and you know adopting this label of apostate it really was um this watershed moment of first uh, recognizing oh no now I have to think about my values I have to think about uh you know uh, what what's being significant is in the world what how I should find meaning in the world, all these important questions that Islam had already made answer for. And suddenly I had to think about that answer myself. So that was, um, you know, it was exciting, but it was kind of scary. Um, and it also, you know, made the future, which was, um, you know, when I was a believer, somewhat, uh, all, you know, cr crafted for me. There was this expectation that I would be, that I would get married and I would, uh, my parents would find my spouse and I would live a certain kind of life. Um, and now I had choice. And this was this, uh, you, you know, it was the future that, that suddenly came into, uh, you know, uh, 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 my my vision and just all of a sudden after leaving faith was something I had never expected up until that point, uh, but it was there and it was one of the more interesting challenges of of leaving the faith. Um, as to adopting the label apostate, I think I you know I stayed away from ex-Muslim from apostate from all these labels. I didn't I didn't like what it implied for a very long time. It wasn't until I I. It, recognize that there were other people who had left the faith and they weren't as lucky as I was. Um, and then it became important for me to take these labels back and, and, and use them as a political symbol. You know, like, I mean, up until that point, it's why I box myself in, why I call myself anything. I, you know, I haven't boxed in before. I don't want to be boxed in again. Um, but then it was uh, when I recognized um, the injustice in the world, especially the injustices faced by so many apostates, um, it became an important thing for me to take take this label um, and willingly put it put it on upon myself um, and stand up for these for these people and for their rights. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And you touched on how that eventually you chose to use to take the label of ex-Muslim and use it as a political symbol. And we know that apostates tend to receive varying reactions depending on the religion they abandon. For instance, within the United States, uh, Christian descent is a fairly normalized practice. For you as an apostate, what reactions did you receive from the Muslim community when you began to speak out? Yeah, um, it obviously wasn't great. <laughs> um, I didn't come out to the community right away. The first people I came out to were my parents and uh, they, obviously weren't very happy. Um, and they weren't, it was more than just uh, being disappointed in me. It was fear for me. Uh, they were afraid for my soul. They were afraid of, you know, the implications of, of what this meant, how I would live my life. Um, they were worried that they had lost me to a lifestyle that they felt was dangerous, um, dangerous in this world and then dangerous in the hereafter. Um, so it was, it was, concern for me and fear for me, I think that motivated my parents um, 
quite a bit uh, when we were having our initial discussions. Um, I call them discussions, but they were very heated <laughs> for for a very long time um, until I think they began to understand um, that my uh, that my disagreements with Islam had more to do with you know philosophical differences and they could when they could uh, uh, the very very different narratives that they're being exposed to and the fact that many mainstream media outlets have decided to take on this activist stance um, rather than a journalist uh, journalistic um, truth-seeking um, uh, stance on broader cultural issues um, certainly that is the case that with younger journalists, um, younger people in general, um, you know, broad criticism over, you know, perhaps an oversimplification of, um, of, of a whole generation. But I have noticed uh, that, that there's a tendency among, you know, people my generation, millennials and, and younger, to, to approach um, uh, things like media and even academia as fields where in which they don't just discover the truth they you know it is their responsibility to craft um what the public will see um because there seems to be a an underlying uh assumption that the the people can't handle the truth as it is, that they they need to be given a more simplified, they need to be told what to think about an issue, um, that they won't, you know, if they're exposed to say too many negative things about Islam and first, for example, or, or about the practices of Muslims and they will become so hateful, um, so intolerant um, uh, that it will lead to, you know, harm and and bigotry and discrimination against these people so we must prevent that by uh actually covering up covering up some of this reality um so there's this that tendency has grown in you know journalism in general which is extremely troubling and i think uh, many people have picked up on it, which is why we don't have the kind of trust in our media institutions that we used to. I think that will only increase um, as uh, the years go on, as there's no kind of correction. Um, you know, we see uh, uh, we see new platforms like Substack, where um, I have a publication. If anyone wants to look me up, um, but you know, we we see we see. Uh, new new platforms that are trying to offer people an alternative um and i hope that this is successful or i hope this um at least motivates the mainstream press into taking um the truth and um objectively just giving the facts as it is uh, more seriously um and to going back to that kind of standard uh but wh where we are now is uh, this strange place where too many people in the mainstream press, too many journalists don't seem to believe in free speech as a broad, um, you know, a cultural value, which is shocking and strange and worrying. It should be worrying for all of us um, that this is the stance that they are, that they're increasingly taking. And, and, and it has worrying consequences for, for, you know, normal people who are just trying to understand the world as it is and finding that there's nothing really they can trust um, to understand the world around them, uh, you know, and it, it makes us more vulnerable, really, to, to uh, extremists. Um, it makes us more vulnerable to anyone who seems like, you know, this guy's honest. <laughs> At least they're honest. They might not know what they're talking about, um, but they're not lying to me. Um, so I think it, it's a very worrying trend, for sure. Yeah, uh, nowadays we have this, this, I guess, unique dynamic when it comes to social media. We know that the United States has the most comprehensive free speech protections in the world, but yet we are seeing this decay of civil discourse. And specifically when it comes to social, social media, it can be arguably called the new town square. But with this in mind, where do you see things going given our, social, our current social evolution? 
Do you see us ever coming out of this chill on free speech? You know, I mean, it's hard to predict uh, the future and I try not to do it too often because it, it, you know, I couldn't have predicted Trump. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I, I, I would never have seen coming um, until they were almost right in front of me and not even then, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, it, when it comes to uh, so, social media held a promise. Um, the internet in general held a promise for free speech, for you know, it, empowering individuals against uh, you know institutions that had money and influence and you know credentials and um you know connections it, it, the internet initially briefly i think held this uh you know th th there was this beautiful wild wild west of of nature of what the internet was and i think a lot of younger people don't know this internet <laughs> have never been exposed to this internet because they know the internet post social media, which is a different space. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and when initially, even when social media came into view, it wasn't immediately clear, I think, to a lot of people. And it wasn't, it definitely wasn't immediately clear to me that there could be harms associated with it too. I saw a lot of the benefits uh, immediately when it comes to ex-Muslim organizing, for example, it has been an absolute um, boon in, you know, a hundred different ways. Uh, we could not have uh, flourished as an organization the way that we have if it wasn't for social media allowing us to find others um, and organize um, easily. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, I include even spaces like Reddit um, when I think about social media to me. So there's a, it's a very, there's a very social element of Reddit. Um, and, and, and those were important places for, you know, truly marginalized people, like truly oppressed people who didn't have anywhere to go, who could voice uh their uh their feelings anywhere safely um you know even with those people that they knew best and and loved best and that that might have been the most dangerous space for them so it was really important that something like this existed um in the past couple of years however um i've seen incredibly worrying trends um uh, that uh, that seem to it, it, it just seems to be getting worse faster really, um, and uh, to some degree uh, Donald Trump um, Russian misinformation right like the concerns about uh, 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 tampering with elections um, pressure from uh, the government on social media companies has made it so that they are. Uh, they are increasingly adopting content moderation policies that are you know, terribly restrictive um, and absolutely against the culture of free speech in every sense of the word. Um, you know, it, and I've, I've been working on this for quite some time, doing uh, you know, my best uh, you know, with ex-Muslim North America, other organizations as well that are experiencing this kind of difficulty on social media platforms where they're not able to advocate for um for for certain uh policies they're not able to effectively speak about even their oppression because even that sometimes goes against uh the content uh you know moderation rules of social media platforms um so we could get our posts taken away if we were to share you know uh a mullah said kill all muslim ex-muslims i share that and i say this is what we're facing facebook shuts my my page down Right, and and that's happening uh, more and more often, and it's hap It's just this big hammer that they appreciate those philosophical differences, even if they didn't entirely agree with them. I think that's when they their views softened up uh, towards my apostasy. Uh, but that took a long, long time, many years. My extended family, they didn't they obviously didn't accept it. They still don't accept it to some degree. I'm sort of persona non grata in some parts of 
you know, my extended family. Um, and when it comes to the community, obviously it was uh, a huge, uh, uh, you know, dishonor stain on my parents uh, and uh, something, you know, a problem that needed to be solved, you know, something that, that they needed to handle and take care of very quickly. So it became important for me to also distance myself from the community. Um, as a matter of, of, of safety, but also just, you know, you know, mental, like, uh, you know, ability to be sane, um, because this is for many Muslim, uh, for many ex-Muslims, uh, the community is the source of uh, the most intolerance uh, that they're going to experience once they leave the faith. Um, for, for many unlucky people, it's, it's actually their, their close family. That's the source of that, their intolerance um, that, they experience um, and sometimes abuse um, and sometimes threats of violence and sometimes, you know, uh, actual violence. Um, so this is something that, it, you know, for, for an ex-Muslim, I think is uh, always on the forefront of your mind. Like, how is your family going to react? Um, what can they possibly do? And you hope and you know, I think everyone is everyone. Everyone loves their family, loves their parents, and wants to think that they will never really harm them. And in my experience in working with ex-Muslims, they always think, uh, "My parents couldn't do this to me. You know, they couldn't, um, you know, harm me in any way. They wouldn't force me to go back to, you know, Egypt or Saudi or Pakistan or wherever it is that that their family originated from." Um, and sometimes they're right but sometimes they're wrong. And so my, you know, advice to them is always before you come out, you need to be in a place where you are financially stable. Um, and that uh, if you needed to take some drastic steps, you could. Um, and even if you don't need to, you know, th that's not a path you need to walk because turns out they were more accepting than you had imagined. Well, that's great, but it needs to be something that's there. And it will also be something that provides you courage when it comes time to, to speaking out and standing up for yourself and your belief that, that you have this alternative, you know, this, this lifeboat waiting for you somewhere. Um, and, and some of the the motivation for starting ex Muslim America ex Muslim North America, I mean, most of the motivation for starting it initially, was to provide people with this um, support system, something that was there, something that they could uh, reach out to if the worst had come to pass, or if you know their family abandoned them and they needed a social space. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. We see kind of this multi dimensional, I guess environment when it comes to ex-Muslims. They're faced with how will their parent or parents or other family members react, but also we have the public sphere. So Sarah, in the past, you've often spoken about how ex-Muslims occupy, occupy a unique space between the left and the right. Can you expand on that and explain how tribal politics affect the activism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was complicated right from the beginning. Um, when I first started speaking out about this, I was very young <laughs> and very um, naive as to what the political realities were outside of my bubble and outside of just this rosy understanding that I had of, of American politics. Um, I had thought that what I was asking from Westerners, um, from especially liberals and leftists, was a you know a a an obvious um, you know a clear um, uh, uh, position that, that you know I couldn't have imagined back then would be would be something that anyone would be would would stand up against. Um, but I found fairly quickly that uh, even in the secularist space in the atheist world immediately there were people that that said um sarah even the, this this word ex-muslim it's so hostile um do don't you want to adopt something that's more uh you know positive and welcoming and what about bigotry against muslims and it was, you know, it was outrageous to me that when I was describing uh, our experiences and all that we had suffered, 
including the reality of blasphemy laws and apostasy laws across the world where we we don't have the right to 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 live right we don't have the right to life um and when you know you come from a group that's persecuted this severely and you 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 finally start to stand up and speak about your rights to have your allies say to you well what about like don't you want to be careful uh about how you're talking about these things in case the people who are oppressing you are you know then um you know unfairly oppressed by others it just felt like a, an extremely unfair burden to 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 um you know send our way given that we were already in a position that that most atheists in America couldn't imagine. Um, and it was, it was right off the bat that this was something that I was experiencing. And then um, when I started to speak out more publicly, when I started to give these talks and have uh, you know, conversations, um, then it, it got worse. And then the smear started coming my way that I'm an Uncle Tom, I'm a native informant, all these um, words I'd never heard in my life. And suddenly they were being thrown at me. And um, I was hurt, um, you know, as a young woman who had this uh, very positive outlook, you know, on what American liberalism was, as this shining beacon of where we could go, you know, in the, the, where the Muslim world could go together. We had this to look forward to, this place that saw equality be between man and woman and, and stood for civil rights and civil liberties. And this was, you know, this was the goal. These were the people that, you know, um, that had achieved something magnificent. And I wanted to be like them. And I wanted them to see that we had the potential to get there too. And to have them then say that this wasn't my place in some way, right? That, that, that my oppression wasn't real or wasn't relevant or was not appropriate to bring up in this political context. Um, that was very hurtful. I was hurt by that. I'm still somewhat hurt by that, although I'm getting over it. It's been a long time. Um, so I've, I've, I've started to move on from it a little bit, but uh, you know, it, it, was, it was finding this strange dichotomy. And then, and then on the actual American right, you know, Amer uh, uh, ex-Muslims often find a very warm welcome. Um, and it's for understandable reasons. Um, the American right has not been very friendly to Islam. Uh, they have been very, you know, hardline on terror and the uh, war against terror. Um, and so it makes sense that from their political vantage point, we would be people that they can just say, oh, look at these guys. <laughs> this is what we were saying about Islam. Um, this is what we were saying about the threat of Muslims. And here are these people and they're talking about these issues and they come from within the community. So you know that they're not, um, uh, you know, they don't have these, the, the motivations that we have. Um, so it, it definitely felt like you were being either used by one political side or you were being rejected and villainized by the other. Um, and so ex-Muslims I think have, have found themselves in this weird uh, middle ground uh, and trying to walk this line, which I think is for most people, even intelligent people, even very, very thoughtful people, it is a very hard line to walk fairly. Um, and I, I, I couldn't say that I walked it perfectly. I don't think that it's it's possible to walk it perfectly. Um, and so, I, I mean, this is part of the, the bigger fissures that are happening in American society. Um, these kind of paradoxical positionings that, that, that each side has on certain issues. Um, yeah, and I think ex-Muslims and our position really, really reflects these sort of bigger cultural problems that we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's just a, a situation where we're just kind of stuck in the middle. And uh, I I want you to elaborate. And why do you think these dynamics exist? Why where's where does their motivation lie of both the left and the right in in their in how they act towards ex-Muslims, for instance? Yeah, I mean, it, with with the right, as I you know mentioned, it was just it's it's the, for their political positions up until now. Um, it, given their stance on the war on terror, um, given their stance on immigration in general, um, I think it for, for them, they see ex-Muslims as 
uh, very convenient allies um, that we can speak towards these issues and then they can use um, our testimonies and our experiences to further um, an agenda that even we might not agree with and many of us don't agree with. Um, I mean, that is not to say that there are no ex-Muslims who are on the right. There are many ex-Muslims who are on the right. Um, I would say that on the whole, though, there are more ex-Muslims that I've personally seen who are on the left and sometimes hard on the left, like very much on the left, um, which is why the experience of being rejected by the left is so commonplace and it is so disorienting. Um, I mean, if we if we truly were um, a a population that naturally found itself on the right prior to becoming more public and open, then we wouldn't have the kind of the, the, these tensions and we wouldn't be you know, complaining about our treatment um, uh, on the broader cultural left. Um, and then it, on the left, I think there's something you know, pernicious that is much bigger than the Islam question, although uh, Islam in general and ex-Muslims in particular really reveal um, these, these fractures um, in, in sort of the coherency of, of modern day leftist thought, um, which is a lot of words uh, um, to, to, make, to, to say that um, I don't know if many people who are now on the left are also liberals. Um, I, in fact, think that the number of liberals is decreasing everywhere on the left and on the right, um, but they have been decreasing on the left for quite some time. And, you know, we can even see that in certain institutions that are, you know, uh, that were once stalwart liberal institutions like the ACLU that are now uh, very much progressive institutions, even leftist institutions, um, not really very liberal anymore, which is shocking because, you know, the ACLU is, um, supposed to stand up for civil liberties are supposed to be liberals. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing that's happening um, to the left. Um, and it's a, it's a confusion that uh, puts the left in a position where their, their, their politics are not coherent. Um, they, they vaguely uh, point towards, you know, we need to help oppress and marginalized communities. And well, who defines what, who is oppressed and who defines who is marginalized? Well, we do. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a politics that is, a, you know, eventually going to lead the left into a position um, that, you know, that, that is, essentially one that they can't come out of um, without abandoning something, uh, without losing something. Um, and, it, you know, I mean, I can go on about this for a very, very long time, because I have a lot to say about this particular issue, but we've also seen, you know, the growth of wokeism. I hesitate to, to say it and to, to touch on it, but um, it, wokeism is definitely something that is, it, it, it's a very pernicious growth. Um, on the left, uh, I think it is an elite religion. That's how I would describe it. Um, it is something that eats away at the core of, uh, you know, what the left is supposed to be, or what I wanted it to be and desired it to be. Um, and it is certainly something that is, um, you know, antithetical to liberal politics. Um, and what we're seeing is this this religion of the elite, essentially, you know, take over institution after institution after institution. Um, and so what the average, you know, Democrat, you know, what the average person on the left has to say about it uh, increasingly doesn't matter, um, which is also what's very frustrating about this, because I don't think that this is something even the average person on the left agrees with. Um, and yet we see it happening anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Now, getting into the big elephant in the room, we have in the mainstream culture and the media, there is this continuous use of the term Islamophobia. In the past, you've referenced how this term kind of serves a self-defeating purpose. Can you expand on this, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I remember when I first heard the term, and I think it was from a Muslim organization. Um, I think it, was, it might have been like a brochure or something, some kind of educational material from like CARE or ISNA. Um, but I remember thinking, 
that, you know, this was going to lead to nowhere good, um, that this was going to confuse the debate uh, even further. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it is something that has confused the debate quite a bit. Um, and at some point, it seemed like maybe we were making headway that people were beginning to recognize that this was not a word that um, was useful to use in this discourse. Um, but I, I think we we haven't really made as much progress as I would have liked to see. And we I still see this word continuously used. And the problem with it is that it conflates criticism of Islam with criticism of or with hate against the people, um, with hate against the believers. And of course, this makes it so that the you know the, those those that really should be talking about uh, the problems within Islam critically, right? The people who are compassionate towards Muslims as a people, but are concerned about some of the practices um, as they relate, especially to to uh, you know liberal principles, um, enlightenment principles. Uh, these are the people that get scared away from this kind of labor. Um, these are the people they don't they don't want to be bigots uh they don't want to hurt anyone and if you throw out a scary label um and you say you wave it about and you say i don't be an islamophobe you know they're going to think oh no i don't want to do anything that could hurt uh an innocent uh, you know marginalized person and they're going to shut up and they're going to climb up um and it seeds the debate to the most extreme voices, the people that don't care about being smeared either because they're just, you know, the, uh, they're, they're the kind of personality that doesn't care, which is very, very few, few of us anyway, or uh, the kind of personality that, uh, you know, it doesn't care about hurting Muslims. Um, and so it seeds the ground to these extreme uh, actors uh, who have very black and white thinking when it comes to this issue and when it comes to, uh, you know, Muslims as a people. Um, I push back on it as much as I could, but un unfortunately, if, if you are, if you are a believer, <laughs> this is a very useful word for you and you definitely want to use it and you definitely want to throw it around as much as possible uh, because you do want to shield your faith and uh, you do want to protect you know, its honor um, and its reputation in the eyes of, of the society that you now live in. And so uh, you'll use this label and you'll push this label on to others. Um, so I think that there's a little bit of a, you know, we have to continue to fight back um, and, uh, and protest against the usages of this word as much as possible. I mean, there's another word out there, there's a phrase, we can use anti-Muslim bigotry. It's perfectly um, you know, uh, legitimate, and it fits the bill, uh, and it doesn't confuse the debate. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's the alternative there. But I, uh, I don't see it being widely adopted, unfortunately. Yeah, I can I can absolutely agree with that. Personally, as an ex Muslim, I have been called an Islamophobe a couple of times for the same reasons that you discuss of the conflation of criticism of Islam with discrimination against Muslims. And to me personally, I kind of see it as insulting because every single family member I have is a Muslim. And to just automatically assume that I have this hate in my heart purely for, for what someone believes in is just, um, it's an oversimplification of my, my standpoint. Uh, but again, I totally, I totally agree with you. I think anti-Muslim bigotry would be more of an accurate term to use. And um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, moving on, more into the media aspect of this discussion. In today's day and age, we see a variety of narratives that are dispersed through the media, such as the typical Islamophobia smear. But how do the actions of the mainstream media affect civil dialogue and the state of free speech when it comes to this? Hmm. So, I mean, this is also something I could probably go on for maybe too long. Um, I'll try to just answer it uh, briefly so that we can move on to, to the other questions and to the Q and A. But um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the discourse in general 
in the West is fairly broken in the in in the United States in the English speaking world, which is obviously very accessible to me online um, and of which I can speak with most authority. Um, uh, I feel like our 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 dialogue is getting more and more uh, toxic and unhelpful. Um, we are all watching, you know, different uh, different movies. Um, and increasingly, uh, it has been for some time that our politicians were very polarized, um, but Americans were not. But I think that it is that that's changing. That Americans are also getting more polarized um, in response to, I think, you know, just uh, you know, uh, uh, attacking anyone with. Um, and it's it's very worrying. It makes me think that. Perhaps social media is not what it uh, initially appeared, and that it might even be worse than than nothing. Because you know, our normal speech in our in our homes, in our you know, in our private lives, it's not as easily monitorable. Uh, but our speech that is happening, uh, increasingly, our social lives are are taking place on on social media online, where they can be watched, um, where they can be uh, you know a uh, uh, shut down in various ways, depending on the platform. Um, and this is a very dystopian uh, you know, future ahead of us if it continues on this path. So I, I really hope it doesn't. Yeah, I, I hope so as well. Uh, now this brings us into our audience Q&A and one of our audience members actually has a question that continues on with the social media discussion. So forgive me for the pronunciation of the name, but Aza Aza De Famili says, why do you think movements like Let Us Talk, which is a movement for people who lived under Islamic laws, sharing their experiences on social media, why do you think movements like Let Us Talk doesn't get attention in the US while it gets a lot more attention in European countries? Um. Well, I think it, it, the U.S. is a very, uh, especially lately, it's in a very strange place. Um, I, I, I think in some ways uh, we've forgotten about uh, the problems of Islam it, in the U.S. Uh, our culture has been taken over by, by other concerns, <laughs> um, racial justice concerns, for example. Um, so there, there's just that element of it. Um, and, and the fact that in Europe, um, immigration and integration, um, and by immigration, I really mean migration, um, refugees, um, it's, it's, it's still an ongoing crisis and it's still an ongoing concern for society in a way that it isn't in the United States. Um, and so because these things are less visible to us now, I think um, ex-Muslims are just, uh, Islam in general is, is, is a topic that people are less concerned with. So there's there's, I think, that aspect of it that's um, uh, that's there. Uh, it's there's also the the, the case that um, our Muslim communities uh, tend to be a little bit more liberal than the Muslim communities in Europe that are that are, uh, far. I mean, there, there are many many reasons why this is, but they're they're far more conservative there, or at least the enclaves of certain communities can be um, extreme. Um, so some aspects of Islam and the harms of Islam are more visible to Europeans. Um, so I think that that's, that that's also playing, you know, like a, a part somewhere. Um, and then, and then in general, I think the discourse in the United States is far more warped. Um, uh, I don't want to go on about it too much, but I, 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 and I touched on it a little bit earlier that, that you know, wokeism is 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 a problem in the United States in a way that it's not, I think, anywhere else in the West. Even um, that uh, there's a certain ideology that has has uh, become dominant among our culture making institutions. Um, that's to say, you know, our academia, our uh, media, um, even our arts, um, which is to say that dissenting voices different you know it, um even dissenting voices from within the left are uh are 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 dampened um and and find it harder to break 
uh, that that wall um, because uh, U.S. elitism uh, works in a specific way. And you know, I don't I don't want to go on about it too too much again. But uh, the, the American activist space looks very different too. Um, our NGO world is different. It's um, it has money and power and influence in a way that European NGOs don't. Um, and that also affects, um, you know, what we talk about and how we talk about it and which pressure groups have a lot of money to, to, to push back um, on certain things or to force certain institutions to behave one way or the other. So Jeff Thompson wants to ask a question regarding the same same sector, he says, has the accusation of Islamophobia increased in the last few years as we've seen a surge in far left dogmas of lived experience, subjectivity and critical theory, et cetera? Um, yes, <laughs> I mean, of course, um, it's, um, it's become impossible to talk about uh, you know, general experiences of oppression, because every time I say, well, the hijab is, uh, this is what it means in an Islamic context, you know, this is the historical um, uh, uh, justification behind the hijab in, in an Islamic context. Uh, this is how many different uh, countries it is enforced in one way or another. Um, this is the percentage of people that believe that it should be um, mandated, you know, in the Muslim world. Um, and I, I, I say all this and, um, all it takes is, you know, one, you know, cool, educated hijabi woman to, to then stand up and say, well, that's not my experience. Um, I chose it. I, you know, uh, you know, maybe even my parents didn't want me to, and I, I wanted to, because it's a reflection of my faith. And that seems to be sufficient. You know, that seems to be an answer to, to, to what I bring up when it is, of course, of course um, you know, an absurd, uh, 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 you know, one data point against uh, a broad experience, but, you know, faced by many, many women who cannot, uh, you know, by virtue of their oppression, actually speak up the way that this woman uh, who is empowered, who has a choice, who is privileged and educated and in the West can. Um, so, so certainly this, uh, this, this in interesting subjectivity that has taken over liberal politics. I mean, we touched upon this issue, this a little bit earlier in the conversation about all that, that is seems to be going wrong in, in, in leftist politics. But I, I think that this is one of those, those many things that, that it is harder and harder to point to material reality. Um, it is harder and harder to point to, uh, you know, experiences by masses of gr groups of people when uh when someone can just say this is my well here's my experience you know here's my lived you know truth um uh you know as a response and that that, that is considered equivalent absolutely just in the case of iran we have uh, many courageous uh, human rights advocates advocates like uh, masi ali nishad or Maryam namazi and we see them speaking about how Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran has compulsory hijab laws and that women can't do anything if they have a hijab on. Um, and you see them speaking out and they occasionally get called Islamophobes. And it's just, it's, it's I guess, just demoralizing to, to have that reaction from the West when these women in the East just want to have individual liberties that we are taking for granted in the West. But moving on from that, we have a couple of other questions. So let's see, Max Car Car Carlyle, Carlyle, I believe, says, with the obvious conflicts between the Muslim and gay trans community, do you think there's progress to be made by publicly highlighting these ideal ideological conflicts considering there's so much attention on transphobia? Um, do you mean, uh, can you read that again? Do you mean the, the, the conflicts between Islam and LGBT? 
uncertainty is uh, yes. you're highlighting that. Oh, yes, certainly. That... Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I think it is just a tough pill for people to swallow. Um, the fact that someone can belong to a marginalized group and be oppressed in one way and also be an oppressor to others in other ways. Um, uh, you know, it, and that makes um, addressing these issues fairly difficult. And what you have to do is pretend like, you know, homophobia and, uh, and, and transphobia and misogyny are just not happening um, in this community that is already marginalized. Um, and I think some of that is just the, you know, the, the toxic consequences of thinking in terms of uh, what will the effect of, of me speaking the truth will be before you speak it um, and trying to think that, uh, you know, let me, let me parse out exactly what people will think and, and what bigots will say. And then, and only if I, uh, the, there's no possibility of the truth being used to hurt anyone will I, will I speak it. Um, and I think there's a real danger to thinking that way uh, because one, we, we, nobody really knows the, the consequences of our speech um, before, we, before we say it. Um, uh, but the second part is that, that, that there, is, there are greater harms to, to suppressing the truth, um, even if it is for good intentions, um, because it is not the case that, you know, if, if, if leftists or, you know, people like concerned, uh, you know, compassionate, moderate people um, don't say these things, don't bring up these issues. It's not the case that they'll disappear. They'll still be there. Uh, people will still talking about them. Uh, and, and, you know, the actual real, you know, xenophobes will be able to use that as a cudgel because, uh, you know, truth is very powerful. And when you, when you have it in your hand, uh, you have a powerful advantage um, that you can manipulate. Um, and if, pe if, if people uh, think that they're, they're the one, uh, that, that you're the one that they should look to, to hear the truth, they will also look to you uh, for solutions, right? Um, and that's, that's obviously something that we, we don't want. So it, it, it's, it's important to, to be honest um, and to talk about this, Inclus including, yes, that, um, that there are many, many tensions um, even, you know, outright hostility, um, uh, uh, when it comes to Islam and, and LGBT issues. Yeah. So stepping more into, uh, solutions or advocacy oriented discussion, Carl Gold, Carl, Carl Goldberg is asking ex-Muslims are an en enormously valuable resource for educating non-Muslims about Islam. How can we get ex-Muslims to speak to non-Muslim audiences? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, I, the internet helps a lot here. Um, if you are, you know, if you're an individual that's just uh, interested in, in, you know, raising our voices in one way or the other, um, invite us to speak somewhere. Um, it's, it's great if it's an, it's an audience that, that you already, you know, there's a, a club or a, uh, you know, uh, a, a group that that we meets um, fairly often to invite an ex-Muslim to speak and share their experiences. Um, you know, even if it is not like a professional speaker, even if it's just a, a, a you know, somebody talented and interesting um, who can share their experiences is better than nothing. Because I think uh, when people hear from a real person, uh, when they can see a face um, to an experience and they can attach that, that, that and, and hear their stories, that that is very powerful and very motivating and it stays with them for a very long time. Um, so just, you know, connecting ex-Muslims um, and putting them in a position where they can share their stories, um, you know, in your local community, that's, that's wonderful. Um, there's also resources online of, of you know, that, that ex-Muslim North America, we've been producing videos um, about issues. We're going to continue to do that work. Uh, we released a vid video on the hijab um, not too long ago. Um, we worked hard to, to cover all the bases with that video, um, all the, you know, uh, argument, popular argumentations um, uh, and uh, questions and concerns when it comes to the hijab and, and, and what we felt like were misconceptions in the debate. Um, so share those resources when you can. I think that's that's also very um, you know very very helpful. Um, 
Yeah, and I think I think you know when we first started uh, speaking up, um, we were we were surprised by how much impact um, you know just that human connection uh, made in people. And I, I you know I remember I was touring quite a bit all all throughout the United States and Canada on this campus tour for a while, you know, and there were small events and um, just a, you know, small group of people often. Um, But years later, some would, some of them would connect with me um, having continued on this work or having been influenced very deeply by what they heard and, you know, changing sometimes their life trajectories entirely um, on the basis of what they heard. Um, So, you know, I, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of that. Um, and to do that as much as possible. Those personal testimonies are very important. Putting a human face on uh, uh, the experiences is very important. Thank you for that. And now as we're closing out, Sarah, do you have any last remarks that you would like to give, maybe to plug your sub stack or anything like that? Yeah, um, more than happy to plug uh, my work. Uh, I You can find... Um, you know, ex Muslim North America on exmuslims.org. Um, we're also exmuslims.org uh, or exmuslims.org on uh, all the social media you know, platforms. Really, we have, a, we have um, some existence there. So you can follow us if you want to follow our work. We're um, doing a lot more, uh, you know, in the coming year, we're planning a lot more, um, you know, videos. So our YouTube channel is something that people might want to, uh, might want to, to, connect with um, and subscribe if they want to see um, what we have coming. Uh, We will uh, also be doing a lot more advocacy work. um, If that's something that you're interested in supporting, Um, you know, our mailing list is on our website, please sign up and we'll tell you, you know, details about what's going on and how you can get involved. Um, If you want to follow me, um, I'm very active on Twitter, although that's, you know, uh, quite controversial. Not everybody likes my Twitter presence, Um, but I have a Substack uh, that I launched um, two, three months ago, almost now. Um, I write weekly essays about all kinds of things um, relating to some of the things that we talked about in this conversation, usually not Islam directly. So if that's what you are wanting, you might not get it there, but um, a lot of the various uh, discussions about culture and, you know, politics and, you know, mimetics um, and activism, um, I like to talk about uh, on my, on my sub stack. So you can subscribe there. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. So this now concludes the conversation. It's certainly opened doors for future discussions on this critical topic. Now, this recording will be available on the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation social media in the coming weeks. So thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thank you for having me.